You know, we are, uh, we're a praying church. There's churches that pray, but we're a praying church. This church was actually birthed out of prayer. Uh, and we know that prayer is our connection. It's our lifeline to God. And you can literally pray out things for your future. You can get answers. You can get understanding. You can also pray things and you can stop things with prayer. And so prayer is a vital necessity to every believer's life. And so, you know, one of the reasons why we have so much prayer is because we want you to have a successful, abundant, prosperous life to where you're in relationship with God by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will tell you, hey, don't do that, or hey, do this, or hey, maybe just hold off. And there's just so many times we could give you story after story. There was a time, my parents were actually in town, and one time we were in town uh, seeing them, and we like to, if anybody knows me, I like to get out and get on the road fast and see how quick I can beat Google Maps or whatever it is, you know, whatever the time is, you know. And uh, for some reason, we ended up staying a little longer than expected and to the point that it was later on in the day, and this was years back, years back. But we just didn't have this this release on the inside. We didn't have this peace on the inside to, to leave, and so we stayed and talked, and so we're like, oh, okay, okay, well, we're going to go ahead and go, and yeah, okay, let's go, and everything was good. Well, that was the exact time that that barge hit the bridge and collapsed the bridge, and if we would have left when we normally leave, we would have been on that bridge when it hit, and we may not be here today because of it. And so it's so important to listen to the Holy Spirit in the little things in your life, and that's why we've been going through this series called The Unseen. Has anybody been getting anything out of it? We're like on week six, and you may be like, well, what is the unseen? Well, if you know anything, you know that you are spirit, your spirit, if you have Jesus in your heart, you're born again. You have a soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions, and you live in a body. And so we are so carnally driven in our lives that we're so ruled by our flesh. Are we not? You know, I mean, it, it, you know, you can look at your screen time, and you're like scrolling, scrolling, scrolling on social media or things like that. That's feeding to the flesh, the eyes, the senses, the ears, and things of that nature. Well, Jesus said some things very specific about how we can live our life and have a, a blessed life or a successful life. doesn't mean we won't have problems, but it means when problems and troubles come, we have a way to overcome them to where they're not walls of Jericho, but they're more like little speed bumps in life. And, and it's really interesting. I thought it was so cool that today, um, well, actually tonight as the sun goes down, um, God's calendar is different than our calendar, by the way. I know some people are like, what are you talking about, all these calendars and God's new year? Well, did you know that God is not American? Anybody? Just want to throw that out there, you know. Uh, <laughs> he's not American. Um, and we live in a Western world, and we have a Western mindset, but we read an Eastern book. The Bible it was, is, is a, a Jewish book of the children of Israel, the the Old Testament is all these, you know, accounts of the people uh, of Israel and people called of God. And the New Testament is, I like to say it like this, the Old Testament is Jesus concealed. The New Testament is Jesus revealed. And so then we see Jesus and how he fulfilled all 640-something prophecies. And I heard one account, it was really cool, that if you were to fill the state of Texas with quarters four feet high, and get one quarter, put a big red X on it, fly out on a helicopter all over uh, the state of Texas blindly and just pitch it out somewhere and then go and drop them off somewhere in the state of Texas and you only have one chance to find that one quarter, one pick. The odds of doing that are in the bazillions. They're, they're far out there. Well, that was the odds for Jesus to fulfill the prophecies and he fulfilled all of them. And so you want to see the significance of everything Jesus did. And one of the things that Jesus did and gave instruction for was during the seven feasts. You get, there are seven feasts that God made. So we have, we have our holidays, don't we? We have Valentine's Day, ladies. Well, she likes Valentine's Day. My wife does. If she was in here, she'd be like, yes! Christmas! We know Jesus wasn't born in December, but we celebrate the birth of our Savior in December, do we not? We put Christmas trees up in this place. We have a good time. 
It's awesome. How about Thanksgiving? Yeah, it's coming close. That's why you're excited. You know, and then we, you know, people do Halloween even. They do these things, but they're all man made. Some not so good. You know, they're all, you know, man made holidays. Well, that's great, and it has a, a significance to it. You know, Abraham Lincoln's wife is the one that came up with Valentine's Day, and, you know, back according to the pilgrims, we have our Thanksgiving Day, and then Christmas, and so on and so forth. But God established certain feasts and certain holidays. And if He set them up, don't you think it's important that we follow them? Because Jesus says when you fast and when you pray or when you celebrate these feasts. And so if Jesus is saying it, then it's important for us to see it. But we think, well, I'm a Christian. I don't have to. All that old stuff's passed away. Yes, all, the old laws passed away, but not the celebrations. The things that Jesus and the things that God have, have instituted and set into place are for our benefit and to keep us in a place of remembrance. And actually today, this evening, is the beginning of God's new year, 5783, or we would say 2023 for us in January. But isn't it interesting that uh, in January, the new year, when it goes from uh, December 31st, 1159 to 12 o'clock, it's January 1st, 120001, you know, like the seconds are ticking off. Nothing really has happened on the planet. It's still cold. There's no, within the next weeks or two, the the seasons are really shifting unless we, you know, we live in Tulsa, so the weather may change. You may have shorts on that morning, and you may be in a, a blizzard jacket by the evening, but historically it stays the same. But look at God's calendar and how the planet is as well. Like right now, it's shifting from summer into fall, praise the Lord. No more 100-degree temperatures. You know, Thursday, we got a little glimpse of that. I'm like, can we just stay in Thursday? Until it just changes completely, you know, because it was wonderful. And, and so t today or this evening is the beginning of God's new year. And so I'm going to briefly talk about that for a second because you should have an expectation. You should have an expectation that God has already set something up good for you. And don't you like it when God tells you the answers to things that you have questions about? I do. And, and, and so I used to think that there are so many mysteries because you know we read portions of scripture we read certain texts of scripture and and we don't read the whole scripture so we get conned by the text by taking it out of context and, and, and so a lot of times we'll read something like oh i hasn't seen and ear hasn't heard was entered into the heart of man you know you say it in that you got to say it like that so it really you know bears witness with you but see, the rest of the, thank you, Jesus, I heard that. That's funny. But see, the rest of the verse is, but God. Everybody say, but God. but God. Has revealed. See, he's revealed things to you. It's revealed to you, but see, you just have to open your eyes and look. I was talking with a friend of mine this morning, and I was showing him a scripture, and he's like, what? Is that, is that always been there? I'm like, Yes. How cool is it that you've never seen it before, but then all of a sudden it just pops up. That's what revelation is. It's always been there. You just haven't seen it. It's like this. It's like, um, uh, let's see who we have here. Steve. So Steve has a blue Toyota Tundra. When he first got his Toyota Tundra, all of a sudden he saw Toyota Tundras everywhere. But three weeks prior to that, he saw Ford Mustangs everywhere because that's what he was focusing on. That's what he said. But then the moment he got the Tundras, then all of a sudden, revelation. Oh, there's Tundras everywhere. And so God has promises for you, set up for you. They're everywhere, but you just haven't really known where to look yet. And, and so... I like to study Hebrew, and I also like to study Greek, and I also like to get references from actual rabbis, Orthodox Jewish people that don't yet have an understanding of Jesus uh, and Him coming. Like here today, this uh, it's literally, it's not Rosh Hashanah, that's what they call it now, but it was really uh, Yom Teruah, which means the, the Feast of the Shout, the Feast of the Trumpet Blast. They're literally expecting for their Mashiach, to come. They're, they think that you know he's going to come on Yom Teruah, which he will. We just not this year, obviously. 
Or, you know, maybe we'll all be disappearing this evening. I don't know. It's a joke, guys. It's a joke. Okay, more coffee. More coffee in the, in the morning. But see, I like to study all those. I like to study all those things out and, and get an understanding because they're written for our benefit. They're written for us, and so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We just go get a good wheel. And so this this rabbi, his name's Rabbi Raskin, and he's a, a very devout Orthodox Jew. Has a very solid teaching and a very solid finding. So they understand some things about Scripture. They understand some things about. Numbers, you know, in letters, Aleph, Bet, the, the Aleph, the, the Bet, the Delet, you know, the Gimel, all these things. So 5783, I'm not going to get into the teaching on that this morning. However, I will tell you this, what all of Jewish people see when they see 5783, they see this, that this is God's year of abundance and financial blessing, as well as miracles, but also judgment. That's what they're expecting for this year. And so whatever that may be, according to, to you, then you can receive it. But see, really, the main thing about Yom Teruah, it's about unity. Have you ever noticed that if you watch constant negative news, or some people call it CNN, uh, or MSNBC, or <laughs> whatever those, those channels are, they all say the same thing? Like almost verbatim, and some verbatim. And so that's fine. That's, that's whatever, if you know. But they're all saying something because when they're unified, they have the same voice, and it gains more traction. The Lord said, even at the Tower of Babel, he says, they're all of one heart and one mind and one voice. Nothing shall be impossible for them. And so then he sent, you know, uh, different dialects in there to, to break that up because what they were saying was this. We're going to make ourselves famous. We don't need God. So we're going to build a tower up to the heavens, and we're going to become famous. Now, see, God's like, no, 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 I'm the one true God. I am the only God, and so you're not going to do that. And so there's something, though, that God knows that there's power in unity. And so part of Yom Tura is really, the, it's a trumpet blast of a ram's horn. So interesting that he talked about Abraham, and the song we did was about Abraham, because the ram was caught in the thicket when he went to, Abraham went to sacrifice his son Isaac. It says there was a ram in the way the Lord has provided. So they would take that horn, and as they boiled the horn, it would take all the stuff out, and they would stretch it out because it would be so hot that they could stretch it out, and then they would blow this trumpet blast. That's what they do on Yom Teruah up to 100 times per day. And there's three different blasts. There's the Tekia, there's a Sharuva, and then there's a Tekia Gedola. One of them is wake up. Wake up from your slumber. Another one is call to arms. Like, get about it. Get about your business. And another one is a, a, a inward reflection. Like, hey, it's time to move on. And so maybe there's some things in our lives that we haven't gotten to the places that we need to be because we haven't let go of things of our past. And it's time to move on. Amen? So I'm going to read one portion to you, and then we're going to get into our message here. Um, it's a time of reflection, awakening, and repentance. And I love what this one uh, rabbi said. He goes, the feeling of yearning exemplified in the shofar's ululations or blasts are meant to inspire us to long to connect to God in a way that is beyond what words can measure. It's a cry of the heart. And just to kind of give you some history, back in 1792 here in America, uh, there was this uh, big taxation, this inflation <laughs> that was like, how are we going to make it? And so the Jewish culture, they actually started to, to turn to the Lord and, and you know, seek God, and they called out to God. And, and so the rabbis had given them the instruction based on the, the numbers that God already had planned out for them and showed them. He goes, the way that you're going to come over through this is through love and through unity. Isn't that interesting? Through love and through unity, and they actually became the most prosperous of all um, the Jewish people during that time in 1792, uh, even to the point that um, they knew that the moment there was divisiveness or jealousy, there would be no blessing in their life. 
it's so important that we don't allow division in because division is obviously the antithesis of unity and if there's if you imagine division if you had a a, a flask and it got a crack in it a division in it it could no longer hold whatever it needed to hold in that and so it's very important that we um stay in a place of unity we stay in a place of love and we stay in a place of being a blessing to other people amen amen so we're talking about the unseen we're talking about the the the, the realm of faith so to say because faith is the tool or, or the vehicle that brings things from the unseen to the seen as we know we've seen that through multiple weeks here uh and if you will turn with me i'm going to recap on uh, one scripture and jump into the rest luke 17 <clears throat> Jesus is talking, and, and he had you know, told them, remember last week we were talking about uh, the mustard seed faith? And he says, hey, if you can speak to this mountain, be removed, it'll be cast in the sea for you. And what are the apostles' response? Increase our faith. Like, what? Increase our faith. And so the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. And we've heard five million you know sermons on that but basically the root of it is this if you can get the seed you can move the tree you've seen mustard seeds how tiny they are but if you'll take that seed and develop it plant it in good soil which would be your heart and water it and cultivate it it will grow and it says that another uh, scripture says nothing will be impossible for you nothing now, you guys know that I used to be a, a trainer and all that stuff and uh, work at a gym and stuff. And so I would talk to tons of different people who would come to me, hey, and, and there, I, I related faith to it this way. Cause so people have like vacation faith. You know, we have New Year's faith, vacation faith, and then lifestyle faith. So vacation faith, like people would come in and say, like, hey, hey, what do you want to do? Uh, well, I want to get in better shape for my vacation. I want to drop some LBs so I can fit in my swimsuit for vacation, right? Or your New Year's faith, the New Year's resolution is like, oh, yeah, I want to lose some weight because this is my year. And usually within two weeks, they're gone. But the lifestyle faith is someone that says, you know what? I want to change my life. I'm tired of living like this. I want some energy. I want some pep in my step. I want to start doing things that I haven't been able to do before. A lifestyle change. And of all those three ones that I have worked with in the past, the ones that were lifestyle people are still living their best life and they're healthy because they chose to make a lifetime change. Now, your faith is the same exact way. We, sometimes we have our vacation faith. Well, I'm believing God, and, and I, I just hope this happens because it's got to happen pretty soon. You know, whether it be a financial thing or I, I'm believing for my husband. And Well, I don't know about that. God doesn't do the voodoo, uh, so you can't really <laughs> work that way. But, you know, we'll be believing God for things, whether it be a financial miracle or uh, something that the doctors report or relational or whatever it may be. And we, we do these short spurts of faith, but there's nothing wrong with that. It still works. But God doesn't want you to live a life to where you're not in communication with him, to where you don't need him anymore. He wants you to have a lifestyle with him because he has things that are coming up that you're going to need his help on. You know, one thing that's also interesting about this Yom Teruah, did you know when the walls of Jericho fell down, that was Yom Teruah as well? How cool is that? It was already Yom Teruah, they just so happened to be that on that day. Very, very cool. <clears throat> so he's saying, if you can get the seed, you can move the tree. Now, here's another scripture reference that's actually tied into this message today, but it was actually this scripture that I'm about to read you was also on the day of Ram Teruah, because if you read the very first part of Nehemiah chapter 8, it says, on the first day of the seventh month. That's what today is right now, by the way. Pretty interesting. Nehemiah 8 says this. You can put it on the screen. And Nehemiah 8, who was, Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe and the Levites, who taught all the people, said to all the people, this is the 
This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. So what had happened is they got the book of the law out and they began to read it and the people start to, they started to see they haven't been doing the things that God had told them to do in order to have a blessed life or a prosperous life. And they were getting upset at God because they were being overtaken by foreigners. They were getting things stolen from them. They were getting things uh, killed in their life. And what does the devil do according to John 10, 10? Steal, kill, and destroy. And so this was happening in their life, and they were upset. They didn't know why. And so then when it was revealed to them, they started to mourn and cry. But I love what God does. God always encourages. And he says this. He goes, hey, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those whom nothing is prepared. That means be a blessing to someone else. It says, go out and have a party. They're like, what? That, that, that does not make sense to me. Because when somebody is knowingly doing wrong, and I know that, and then they come to me, and they're like, oh, man, I, I shouldn't have done that. I'm like, yeah, you shouldn't have. Yeah, you, you need to suffer in that a little bit. Right? You need to wallow in that for a minute. No, no, not at all. No, thank God that it's mercy is new every morning. Thank God that he has grace that extends from generation to generation. He goes, hey, now that you've repented, go out and have a party. Eat, drink, and be merry. And then he goes on right after this and says this. What does it say? Do not sorrow for what? What is? The joy of the Lord is what? It's your strength. So if you're not feeling strong in your life, what do you need? You need to get some joy. Not your joy, his joy. Well, how do you do that? Say, Lord, I thank you that you know the end from the beginning. I thank you, God, that you're going to make a way where it seems like nowhere. And I'm choosing to be in faith and to have joy. And sometimes you got to notify your face. You're like, praise the Lord. Yeah, God is good. Well, notify your face and your attitude is the choice to rejoice. Because when you choose to rejoice, that's where the strength is. Now, now I'm going to give you another scripture because here's the thing about your faith. Your faith gives action to God's power. He says, you guys need to rejoice. And so the, the problem is, you know, I love what Pastor Dana said a few weeks ago. She said, uh, what was it? Mind your business. Was that what it was? <laughs> Worry about yourself. Thank you. That little, that little girl uh, that could hardly talk, she goes, Henry, what, what was it? Worry about yourself. Worry about yourself, Dada. Worry about yourself. Well, what about, worry about yourself. And see, that's what we like to do. Well, what about this? And, and, and the Lord's like, hey, 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 hey. Worry about yourself. We're not here to judge other people. We're not here. Now, granted, sin is sin, and you need to quit it, forget it, and move on with it. You need to let it go. Don't go back to it. But don't be judging other people because you used to be that person. So anyhow, 1 Peter uh, 1, 5 through 8. Check this out. Now, when it says the word who, that, that's us. So say we, we are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So I want you to notice something. We are kept by the power of God. It's God's power. Say it's God's power, but it's my faith. See, he's got the power. You've got the faith. Your faith is the the uh, vehicle or the action to God's power. So it's up to you. Now the next verse says this, verse 6, click. In this we greatly rejoice. What? What are, we, what are we doing? Greatly rejoicing. Greatly rejoice means this. Jump up, spin around, and shout. We kind of talked about that a second ago. It was like, yeah, woo! Get excited, even though it doesn't feel very exciting. But it's saying we greatly rejoice Though now for a little while, say a little while, 
if you need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Well, doesn't that sound like a terrible time to rejoice? Hey, you're going to go through some pretty tough trials. So here's what you need to do. Rejoice when you really don't feel like it. And you just got a letter saying that you're past due and that you also are overdrawn on your bank account. Oh, and by the way, the doctor says that they don't even know what to name what you have. Isn't that interesting that we like really get excited about that? Like, oh, the doctor says that what I have, they don't even know what to call it. That's not a good thing, guys. That's not something to get excited about. It's like, you know what? You know, uh, uh, it, we, we just like to be special, right? Like, oh, oh my, oh, no, no, no. Yeah, because somebody will tell you, hey, what? oh, my back's hurting. Well, you need to go see this chiropractor. He's really good, and he'll, they'll loosen you up real good, and they won't even crack you. They won't pop you, they give you x-rays, and they'll look at it, and they'll assess the situation. And, oh, no, no, no. My doctor said that my thing's special that they can't even, it's so special, they can't even, they don't know how to operate on it. And then we take ownership of our sicknesses or our weaknesses or our lack, and we carry it around like it's a shield or a badge. The devil's lulled us into this lie of settling for a low-level living. You remember Mephibosheth? Mephibosheth lived in low to bar. I love that the name is low to bar because you live and you lower the bar for your life. When he was royalty and was supposed to be living in the king's palace. But he was crippled. And sometimes we are the ones that cripple ourselves from walking in healing and wholeness and restoration with your family or your relationships. But you've got to choose to let go of the old in order to make room for the new. If anybody knows that, it's us right now because... We're building a house, and we've been in our other house for 20 years, and man, are we getting rid of some old. We rented a 23-yard dumpster, and I filled that sucker up, and I'm like, we got to fill up some more. My wife's like, no, we got, we got rid of everything. I'm like, no, we need to get rid of more. Why? Because I'm ready for the new. See, you can't get the new when you're still holding on to the old. God wants to do a new thing. He wants to give you a new hope, a new life, a, a fresh fire. You remember it says that he anoints my head with oil? That's another time because he got dried up. You need to get anointed again. And to where you can overflow. Well, how is he overflowing? I mean, he's already full of some, some of it. He got down a little bit, so he filled him back up. That's what we're supposed to be doing is spending our time with the Word of God, in the Word of God, and praying. And that's how you get filled up. So he's saying you're going to be going through some stuff, but you need to rejoice during those questionable times, during those tired times, during the times when the last thing you want to do is rejoice. You should. You know our story, the, you know, the whole house situation 15 years ago. We didn't want to rejoice. We did, and then God did, and it, the rest was history. Amen? Now here's why. It says this. This is why. This is when you'll start looking at things differently. And uh, um, I got a guy that uh, we've been friends for, oh my gosh, like 27 years, 27, something like that. Back in 95, I met this guy. I was working at this dealership, and we used to, at, at night, we had to go and lock all the cars, you know, uh, and make sure they're locked. And so we would go out and walk together. we just walk and talk, walk and talk and lock cars. And then we just keep walking. Even though the cars are locked, we're just walking around talking about stuff and having a good time. Well, fast forward about, I don't know, 22, 23 years, I go to, I'm working at a gym, and there he is. We had worked at another places before, you know, we had gaps in time, and sure enough, you know, we were working, I was like, hey, man, I can't help but, like, if someone's doing something, not wrong, but just, you know, they could make it a little better, I'll be like, hey, you got to try this and this, and they're like, oh, that's good, you know, and he's like, hey, you want to work out? I'm like, heck yeah, let's do it, and so, so now we work out together, and we, we don't feel like we're getting a good workout if we're not sore. Isn't that pretty sick? No, see, some people are like, no, that makes sense. You're doing something if it's sore. But why is it in our life when some opposition comes that's sore? Oh, I don't like that. Get behind me, Satan. Uh-uh. Well, well, let me tell you what Peter says. Here's what Peter says. He goes, hey... This soreness that you're going through, 
It's the trying of your faith, and it's much more precious than gold that perishes. So when gold's tested by fire, it's found to be the praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus. Whom having not seen you, you love him. You haven't seen him, but yet you love him. And he says, hey, this stuff is in the words of Ronnie Coleman, lightweight, baby. And some of y'all are like, what? It's easy. It's temporary. It's subject to change. See, you all have the same measure of faith on the inside of you. It just needs to be developed. It just needs to grow. I mean, according to, to what Jesus said, we at least have mustard seed faith. And everybody has the same number of muscles. Did you know that? We all have the same number of muscles. If I was to bring, you know, little baby Johnny or a, a child up here, or, you know, Aiden or somebody, you know, he'd be here and I'm here and my muscles are bigger than his, but we have the same exact number. Well, I've been around a little longer. and I've developed them a little bit more. And so that's how you're supposed to be walking with your life of faith is developing those things of faith. It's not like retirement. There's no retirement in your faith. Well, I'm retired. I'm just, I'm living on all the faith from I've been depositing the past 30 years. Oh, you need a miracle? Hold on, let me see. Hold on. How much is it? Oh, 45. Whoa, that's an expensive miracle. I might have to sell my car for that one. I don't know. And that's, we don't live a life like that. Your faith that says the word of God is alive. It's quick. It's sharper. And it doesn't say faith was in Hebrews 11.1. 1. It says faith. Faith is now the substance of things hoped for. It's present. It's active. It's alive. Paul was telling Timothy, he's the one he was mentoring in 2 Timothy 1.3. If you're taking notes, write that down. Paul was telling Timothy, he says, hey, I want you to stir up this gift of faith. Let's read it. It should be on there. Uh, when I call to remembrance the genuine true faith, everybody say true faith, that's in you which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm also persuaded it's in you. He grew up in a household of faith. He saw his mama. He saw his grandmama. He saw them all in faith. And he's like, hey, I'm believing this is you. And I love uh, different translations, so I, I like to pull them all up. And the Woist translation, it's not the worst. W-U-E-S-T, Woist translation says this. Not true faith. It says unhypocritical faith. Your faith that is not hypocritical, you know, all talk, no walk, or doing the polar opposite that you're saying. Here's another one. <clears throat> it says here that it is a genuine faith, a true faith, an unhypocritical faith. So if there are those three things that we can at least see, that must tell me there is a genuine, real, true faith, but there's also a false faith. There's a fake faith. A hypocritical faith? If it's unhypocritical, that means there could be a hypocritical faith. A pretend faith? Counterfeit faith. There's so many times that I've called things faith and ended up in a disaster. It was really my selfish need. Rewind 25 years, I saw these suits that I wanted, and so I called it faith. I'm going to buy these suits by faith. No, I bought them with Discover card. And they're going to get paid off in Jesus' name. Yeah, when I go to work and then take money out that I'd be spent on something else and pay it off like this one, that was just stupid. See, a lot of times we're like, Lord, I need a financial breakthrough. No, what you need is financial peace. You know, Dave Ramsey, budgeting. Learn how to budget. Hey, I'm all for miracles. I'm all for increase. I'm all for abundance. But I'm also for stewardship. Are, how are you stewarding what you get? Like, I, I only make like, I don't make very much money. Oh, really? Okay. What do you mean? Oh, only like, you know, 50000 a year. Oh. Oh. <laughs> okay. Man, I just don't, I can't, I can't really afford anything. Well, well, what's your day look like? Well, I get up and I go to Starbucks. Okay, well, that's $8 right there. 
Um, and then I, sometimes I get hungry, so I'll stop by McDonald's. There's another four. Okay, we're at 12. Uh, and, and then I'll do this, and then, and then I've got Netflix subscription, Paramount Plus, because I can't miss Yellowstone. And then, and then uh, there's Hulu. I got Hulu, but I only watch the good stuff. I don't watch the bad stuff on Hulu. And then there's the Netflix. And so, and you're, oh my gosh, well, I can help you real quick. I don't even got to lay hands on you. I just got to tear up your credit card. Now, I don't know why I got off on all that, but what I'm trying to tell you, yeah, yeah is to check yourself before you wreck yourself. That's Paul Cooper translation. Don't try to put your faith on something when you know it's just you wanting it. Don't try to get hyper-spiritual if God didn't tell you to do it. Check this out. 2 Corinthians 13. I'm going to read this in the Amplified. This ties in with what Pastor Daniel was saying a while back. Examine and test and evaluate your own self. Not your husband or your wife. You quiet in here. <laughs> to see whether you're holding to your faith. To your faith. And showing the proper fruits of it. And it goes on and says, test and prove yourselves, not Christ. What? Test and prove yourselves, not Christ. The New Living says this, examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. The Good News translation says this, put yourself to the test and judge yourself. Find out whether you are living in faith. So what we do, we, we choose to live in faith and not to judge other people, but to handle ourselves, handle our own business, right? Now, what's so interesting on this is you have to receive a word from the Lord or you have to see what it says in the Bible about your situation, but then you need to act on it. Now, I have two girls, and usually if I ask them to do something, they're like, okay, Dad, got it, and they're great. They're both good at it. They'll do whatever I ask them. They're not defiant or, or anything like that, but there's sometimes when I'll say, hey, I need you to do that for me. Okay. Well, 20 minutes later, hey, did you get that? I'm doing it right now. And then 10 minutes later, did you get it? I, I, I'm doing it. Gosh, Dad. Now, that's how I am. That's how I am when, when I'm the very same way. And so I get mad, but then sometimes I'm like, okay, oh, sorry, I should have said that because, I, you know, I do the very same thing. We all do. If we were honest with ourselves, if we check ourselves, we're like, oh, I'm about to get to that. Oh, I'm about to do that. Well, God has already told you the answer to the situation, and then you're still asking him. He's like, I already gave you the answer, but you haven't done it yet. You haven't started. And so I'm going to read something for you as we come to our, our close shortly. And this is in Deuteronomy chapter 1. And this is for the children of Israel there. And so it says, hey, we departed from Horeb, and we went through all the great and terrible wilderness, which you saw on the mountains of the Amorites as the Lord God had commanded us and we came to Kadesh Barnea and I said to you you have come to the mountains of the Amorites which the Lord our God is giving us that's awesome that's giving you some things so look the Lord has set the land before you go up and possess it as the Lord God of your fathers has spoken to you don't fear or be discouraged well that's great he's giving you instruction here's some land go possess it don't be afraid don't be dismayed I'm giving it to you don't be discouraged and here's their response. Every one of you came near to me and said, hey, let us send, before, send men out before us, out into the land and bring back word if we really should go to the cities. Well, didn't God just tell them to go? He's giving them the land. He didn't tell them to send spies. He says, hey, no, I'm, I'm sending them to you. See, we think God told them to send spies. It's the people that said, hey, let us send spies. God didn't tell them. God just says, go in and possess the land. But that's what we like to do. We, if it doesn't make sense to us, we like to, like, let's, let's work it on out. Let's, let's make it real, 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 real practical. I'll get to it. I'm getting to it. I'm getting to it, right? And so he goes, okay, 
So the plan pleased me. So took 12, this is Moses talking to each tribe, and they departed, went into the mountains, the valley of a skull, spied it out, came back, says, hey, God was right. Surprise. God was actually right. It is a good land, and he is giving it to us. Nevertheless, this is God talking to him. Now, nevertheless, you wouldn't go, but you rebelled against the command of the Lord your God, and you complained in your tents. See, they didn't complain in the temple. They went home and started complaining. Well, I don't know why a pastor does that. I would have done it differently. Uh, uh. And you said, because the Lord hates us, he's brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Well, none of that was true, was it? Absolutely none of it was true. Zero. But see, when you start complaining, you get deceived. You need to write that one down. If you start complaining, guess what? You're in the deceived zone. There's a difference between a healthy conversation and adjusting and making things right, but complaining, according to this, as you'll see, God calls it evil. And they go up, they're super discouraged, even though we told them just previously, don't be discouraged. He goes, where can we go? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts. Well, that's why I told you not to send spies. I just said, trust me, go into the land, be courageous. The people are greater and taller than us. Well, you're short people. I mean, I'm probably Jewish. I don't know. I know I'm Italian, but I'm probably Jewish too. Who knows? I'm short. Everybody's taller than them. But these Amorites were large, and they said their, their cities are great, and they're fortified, and, and they go all the way up to heaven. Don't you know that criticism turns into exaggeration? Were they really all the way up to the heavens? No. Were they really uh, as grasshoppers? No. In their own eyes, they were. Moving along. It says, then I said, don't be terrified or afraid of him, for the Lord your God goes before you. He will fight for you. See, God's mercy is so good. He says, even though you've complained, even though you're saying all this stuff, don't be terrified. Don't be afraid. I'm going to go before you, and I'm still giving you a chance. I'm going to carry you just like I carried you back in the day. And he goes, yet for all that, you didn't believe the Lord your God. And he went the way before you, and he searched out the place that you pitched your tents and to show you the way you should go by fire by night and a cloud by day. But the Lord heard the sound of your words and was angry and took an oath, saying, Surely none of these evil generations. God calls complaining evil. And so he says, none of them are going to enter into this good land, which I swore to their fathers, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and see to it that him and his children I'm given them which they will, because he wholly followed the Lord. Now what's interesting as we continue on, the Lord said to him, hey, don't go. Don't go fight in Horeb. I'm telling you, I, I told you before to go, but because you you didn't obey your your, your delayed obedience is disobedience. Delayed obedience, disobedience. I'm very guilty of that in the past. I'm getting much better. I don't delay any longer. But delayed obedience is disobedience. And it says, don't go up into the land. Don't go into Horeb because you're, you're not going to win. Wait, didn't you just tell us we were going to win? Yeah, if you would have done it when I told you. Look at it. It's in verse 42. The Lord said, tell them don't go up to fight. I'm not among you now, lest you be defeated before you enter. So I spoke to you, yet you wouldn't listen. You rebelled against the command of the Lord and presumptuously went up into the mountain anyhow. They, listen to this. This is verse 43. They decided to go when they wanted and said they were going up in faith. How crazy is that? 
See, the issue was is that God had been doing all these miracles in their life and, you know, delivered them through the Red Sea and, and deli- all the chariots, you know, drown and all that stuff. And so what had happened is they had become familiar with the miracles of God. Familiarity is a miracle killer. Jesus could do no mighty work in his own hometown. Why? They were familiar. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't this the guy that was playing soccer with us when he was 11, 12, whatever? See, you cannot allow familiarity to seep into your life. Think about this. When Jesus was at the well, the woman comes up to the well, and she, he says, hey, give me some water. She says, hey, uh, why are you asking me to give water? You don't even got uh, anything to draw from me. He goes, you draw it out for me. And she goes, oh, I, you don't know who I am. He goes, yeah, I don't. But I know this. You've been married five times to the guy you're living with right now. You're not even married. And then suddenly she gets real spiritual. For I perceive you're a prophet. <laughs> You got to hear it sometimes I'm around people, and they're like, blankety, blank, blank, blah, 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 blah. And they're like, what do you do? Oh, I'm a pastor. Oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> so, so hallelujah, the other day I was, you know, <laughs> they start, their whole conversation changes. And I'm like, well, you were talking that way before. Why are you changing it now all of a sudden? Well, there's an honor there. They don't want to, you don't want to become familiar with that. You don't want to come, you want to reverence that. And so she started to reverence, and because she said, hey, I perceive you're a prophet, now she's opening up and allowing for that prophetic utterance to speak into her life. See, what you honor and what you value, you're allowing into your life. But what you become familiar with, you're closing off. So you just be very careful to watch out who your buddy buddies with and who you honor and don't honor and value and don't value. Very important. <clears throat> so, so how do we maintain this passion? How do we maintain uh, this faith, this life of faith? Well, honor. You know what the, the, I've noticed over the past, I've only been pastoring as a lead pastor for, what, seven-something years, but uh, started when I was 12. But I've noticed... Of all the people that I've seen that have started to backslide or just kind of get away from God or just do their own thing, it all started with ingratitude. Ingratitude is the beginning of backsliding. It's the beginning of offense. It's the beginning of betrayal. It's the beginning of so many things. So, so how do you maintain your passion? Well, you maintain the honor. You maintain the reverence. And you maintain this consistency because it's that consistency in spending time with the Lord and spending time in prayer that's what's going to cause you to grow. Amen? So, so what uh, ungratefulness looks like is you come in expecting instead of being grateful. Like this, well, I don't know what, maybe he can teach me. I don't know if he can teach me anything today. I've already learned it all. I was preaching that before he was even a diaper. You know, it, it's just, you know, that haughtiness. You got to watch that. I make sure that I keep myself, I try to humble myself. You keep your, I'm the most humble person I know. No, I'm just kidding. That's a joke. That's a joke. It's a joke. It's a joke. But it's very important that you keep yourself humble, that you're always checking yourself with the word and checking yourself having people around you to, to you know, submit yourself to and, and to challenge you. Because when you grow familiar, uh, that gratitude starts to seep out. You know, there, there, uh, you guys know about our founding pastor in man. If you ever had an opportunity to get offended, you, there was plenty of opportunities to get offended. Because she'll just tell you straight up, and sometimes she'll be com- completely wrong but you have to honor that office and honor that gift and they you know there were times that she'd say things and I was like that's 100% wrong I didn't even do that you know but they're like yes ma'am okay I'm gonna honor you and then you know what eventually some of them worked around and some of them didn't but I honored and because I honored that it allowed for a place for God to speak through her into my life and so it's so important that we honor 
And see, you can't really even be in faith if you're not honoring. I'm sorry to, to go so long, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close it up. I'm going to close it up. Proverbs 19 says this. Proverbs 19, check this out. <clears throat> Verses 2 and 3. Uh, this is the New Living Translation. Enthusiasm without knowledge is no good. I'm excited, but I don't really know what to do with it. Haste makes mistakes. People ruin their lives by their own foolishness, and then they're angry at the Lord. How many times have we done that? I'm super guilty of it. My wife's even told you guys about how, how guilty I am of it because there's been a time that I was, you know, making a decent amount of money and I was a, you know, God had done one thing after another for me. Like I was bought a man on the totem pole. What is he in the right position? And they promoted me and promoted me and promoted me and they become number two in the company. I'm like, woohoo, look at God, it's amazing. And then I got to a place to where, um, we had certain finances, and we had certain things. And I remember yelling at 2.30 in the morning in the middle of my den, God, is there anything else? Like just a haughty, young, stupid kid. And I'd jump out, and this is God, and we're going to do this. And then, plow, faith failure, faith failure, faith failure, one after the other. And then I would get angry at God. Because I would jump out and say, oh, yeah, God this and God that. You have to be careful when you're saying, oh, well, God told me. You know, yeah. Did he? Did he or is it just you? Listen to the message translation. Ignorant zeal is worthless. Listen to this. Haste makes waste. I want to get a T-shirt that says that. Haste makes waste. People ruin their lives by their own stupidity. So why does God always get blamed? That's a good one. That is a good one. <laughs> People ruin their lives by their own stupidity. So why does God always get blamed? Selah. <laughs> Ponder that. See, the main thing is, is seek God first. For him first, Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his way of doing things. The, 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 what is the kingdom of God? We know what that means, the way heaven operates. Seek how heaven operates first, and then all of these things will be added to you. You don't seek the things, you seek how heaven operates. You go, you know what? The Lord's telling me to do this, or I, I, I feel unction to do this, but it's not making any sense. You better obey that. Because if you do, then and you respond, um, be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit's saying to you, as long as it's lined up with the Word of God, then you're going to see Him move. And you remember the story I told you about the, the hostess, you know, that we, we, you know, blessed her with a tip or whatever, and, you know, they don't get tips or whatever, you know. But the thing was, is it was a setup for what God has next. So the next time I see that lady, I guarantee you God's going to tell me, uh, well, I hope he tells me, uh, to lay hands on her, to pray for her, for her, her back, you know, because she was hobbling, you know. And, and I believe that, the, that those seeds are being planted and they're being watered. And so it's so important to follow after what God's saying, you know, hey, go, go take this job, even though it's making $12,000 less than you currently make. That's what he told me 25 years ago. 24 years ago and and I told my wife I was like I feel like God's on this so let's pray and we prayed and she's like yep you should do it well that that doesn't make any sense hey let's go make a thousand dollars less a month but we're just getting started and we're living in my parents house upstairs praise the Lord but we did and then God did and within a year we were building our very first house and it was so cool because people were saying uh, on her family, they're like, man, are his parents rich? I'm like, no, not at all. Does he have a rich uncle? Uh, no, but I got a rich God. <laughs> See, it pays to obey. And when you obey, the when he tells you, that's where the anointing is. 
the burden removing yoke destroying power so it's so important that you follow what the holy spirit's telling you to do in that moment get connected as part of the dream team that's how i started and that's what i started learning and developing and growing because i was around other like-minded people that were experiencing and talking about faith just like i was that's what you need to do and when you do that you're going to see god move amen now i want to close with this last story um, being that it's Yom Torah. Now, <clears throat> over in, in, in California, there is this vineyard, and, and this, the, I don't know the extent of the story other than this. Uh, this is kind of what, what spoke to me, dude. Is this, there was a, you know, fire and drought that's been around there this past year, year ago, uh, and it greatly affected a bunch of vineyards negatively out there, tons of them. And so one vineyard in particular, the owner felt impressed to go and harvest on the ridge of his property, the high place, not the low where the good stuff was, the high place that is more prone to the elements, and if you know anything about grapes, that's not good, more prone to the elements, harvested at 2.30 in the morning. So he goes and he harvests this, and they harvested six tons of Cabernet Sauvignon. For some reason, the moisture, and it caused them to be plump, and all they, they harvested, and it was actually uh, their best yield yet of that wine. And so what that reminded me was the scripture of Jesus at the wedding feast. It was his first miracle, and he said, I'm saving the best for now. And I believe that if we would stay in this attitude of faith and be obedient to the Holy Spirit, stay in the Word, stay in your worship, stay in your, your time of prayer, make that time, I'm telling you, make that time with Him. If it's just seven minutes, just spend seven minutes in prayer. Set your timer on your phone and just pray. Pray for, when you run out of things, pray for, and it's only been a minute and 27 seconds. You could pray for the church, you could pray for, hey, that person that was playing the guitar or, or that guy that I saw in the, the pink shirt or the guy with the glasses. You know, God knows. You don't got another name. But you start praying and it's going to start doing something in you and developing in you. And the Holy Spirit will start talking to you about things. And you'll start seeing him open up in ways and in channels that you never could do on your own. Amen. It's all about obeying the voice of God. And when you obey his voice and seek first his kingdom, all these other things are going to be added to you. Amen.